Please welcome to the stage, Senior Marketing Manager for Siemens, Patrick Farrell. everybody. Um, again, I'm, I'm also excited to win, to win the telescope here a little bit ago. Uh, my son will be excited about that. Now the, the trick is going to be how am I going to get that back to Detroit on the airplane. So now I've got a, a little task ahead of me here. But, um, so I'm here to talk about today is really about what are we doing for innovation? How can you innovate more? And I'll start with uh, one of the most famous innovators of all time, Thomas Edison. So as he developed the light bulb, it said he took you know, maybe a thousand tries before he got to the right combination that, uh, for a successful light bulb. And so a reporter asked, you know, went up to Thomas and asked him, you know, how did it feel to fail 1,000 times? And of course, Thomas says, I didn't fail. Really, the light bulb was an invention that took just 1,000 steps. So really, what, what can we do to, to engineer innovation more into our products? What can you be, do to be more like Thomas Edison, but do it in a fraction of the time it took him to do it? Simulation and big computing are a big part of that, and we'll help you do that today. And I think as we've heard from a number of the uh, presentations we've heard today and yesterday, uh, we, we've heard that a lot, how, how simulation has been able to help them. They're able to innovate, run many different iterations. And so what I'm going to talk about over the next course of these next few minutes is how simulation um, has really been part of one of the really original drivers of big computing. I'll give you a little bit of history of where simulation is coming from and where it's going with the, with the increase of computing power as it's gone over the, the decades. So for those of you who are not familiar with engineering simulation, let me give a little very brief, very basic explanation of what it is. So in terms of engineering simulation, it's not the physics generators that you might see in games or that just kind of make things look like they're happening in real life. Really, engineering simulation is very much founded in mathematics, um, specifically, a lot of them, one of the major areas of mathematics is finite element analysis. And, and basically, what, that, what, what engineering simulation does is it's actually measuring how products perform. We're trying to find out what the stresses are, if a product is going to actually break, how, how different pieces move together, how does fluid flow through different types of geometry. So we're really doing very detailed types of analysis. It's not just for pretty pictures or for show. So it starts with basically geometry. So your designer would create a basic Geometry, like you see here, this is just a very basic metal bracket. Then basically the engineer would take that, and in the finite element method, what that does is you, it takes that geometry and it gets remodeled. We need to remodel it into very small elements, basically. So we need to discretize that model. And basically each of those places where the, the elements intersect, the, the nodes where the points come together, essentially you have six degrees of freedom. And then you multiply that across all the different number of nodes. And that essentially gives you the, the, the number of equations that need to be solved. So that's essentially why we've always needed computing power to be able to solve this, because you can easily get the thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, and now we're up in, in the billions of degrees of freedom that need to be solved uh, on these models. Um, then you also apply your, your loading and your boundary conditions. So here it's fixed at the bottom, some pressures or, or forces up at the top. And then you simulate it. So you submit that to the computer. It solves it. It runs the numbers. It does all the calculations. And then you get back some results so you can actually see how the part deforms, where its stresses are, um, and, and make sure that it's meeting the product requirements that you, you've designed this part for. So finite element analysis is really kind of the foundation for a number of different types of physics simulation. That's what I'm really talking more specifically about. Of course, there's lots, lots of other simulations like, like we've seen you know, with, with software simulation as well as getting into controls and looking at you know, autonomous vehicles. But what I'm really talking about in this case is physics-based simulation, so structures, structural analysis, dynamics, durability, um, you know, getting into composites, CFD, thermal flow. Uh, motion multi-body dynamics, which is really more about seeing how, how different mechanisms move, and then these can also be applied to acoustics. So in general, this whole area is really considered computer-aided engineering, or commonly known as CAE. So the history of, of CAE really dates back, I mean, the finite element method, the mathematical method, it started, was developed in the 40s. So before computers even existed, but Nobody could really use it, again, because you've got, you've got to calculate hundreds, thousands of equations at that time to be able to do anything. So it wasn't really until the 50s when the first computers, like the IBM 701 that you see here in the picture, came about, and you can start being able to perform this. Now, what's also interesting 
uh, about this picture. You see, there's no monitor, there's no graphics, there's no fancy 3D graphics. So the way people used to have to make those models in the past were actually by hand. Um, they would take the CAD drawing, or not even the CAD drawing, the drafting drawings, and basically trying to map out where those nodes, where the elements would be in space, put them in the punch cards, and you kind of see the, the, the woman there up in front, she's got a stack of, of cards, and so usually what a lot of times what we call uh, finite element models today are decks. So you have a deck of cards, that's where the terminology comes from, and then they feed that into the computer, and then it performs the calculations, and then you get the results back, and you need to interpret the results. So simulation has really been um, a driver to big computing. I mean, this was state-of-the-art technology you know, 60 years ago, more than 60 years ago. So simulation has really been at the forefront, really pushing computing power as far as it could go. And it really wasn't until the 1960s is when things really started to heat up. So during the space race um, is when uh, finite element analysis became really important because obviously trying to simulate or trying to build and break large rockets is not physically possible. It's hard, you're dealing with uh, environments that are not we're not able to really physically test. So another reason why simulation is also important was to help beat the Russians to market. So being able to do the simulation means they're not having to do that, that build or break. You can iterate more, get more finding out, making sure that your, your designs are meeting performance. So that was another critical component. And that's why, again, also simulations used today is, is a competitive advantage against uh, the competitors, uh, competitors that you have out there. So another thing, you know, so simulation is, has been constantly pushing the hardware uh, capabilities. And, but one of the other things you need to keep in mind is all simulations are wrong. Simulation, especially the finite element method, is really an approximation method. So they're all basically just estimates. It's just that some simulations are better than others. And there's a lot of assumptions that go into to building these models. Um, so the, the, the model on the left is actually, the, the picture on the left, I mean, this is, the, both of these pictures are actually uh, the two same simulations, but the one on the left was done in 19, early 1990s. Uh, these are fluid dynamic simulations here, just some water flowing out of a kind of a reservoir. Um, you see that, so based on the computing power, I mean, simulation's always been really hampered by the computing power at that stage. So we've had the, the, you know, the mesh that you saw in there, um, Going to finer meshes means more equations, so we haven't been able to get really fine meshes, which means you're obviously not capturing all the, f the full fidelity of a model. Whereas, you know, on the right, the image on the right is something that was done in, in around circa 2010-ish. So you can kind of see the difference in terms of fidelity of, of how simulation is, has changed over time. So the one on the left, uh, you can see the elements. They're quite large elements. You can see how it's broken down. It's a 2D model instead of a 3D model. And you can see even by the results, um, they look quite different. The one on the right, you see a lot more fidelity. You can kind of see the, the waves and splashing and thing of, of the liquid coming out. So computing of power has allowed us to increase fidelity of the models and get more closer to mech, get closer to accuracy and being able to predict performance much cl more closer to rea reality than we have been before. But another part of computing that... Um, you know, people don't necessarily think of that actually impacts the entire CAE analysis process. So a big part, as I mentioned, of, of performing CAE or finite element analysis is the, the modeling process itself. So understanding how much elements you have on your model. You also need to make sure that your element quality is correct. Otherwise, that can also skew, uh, screw up your results. So a big part of the CAE process is actually analysis modeling. And you can, if you look at the entire CAE process itself, Sometimes that analysis modeling step can take as long as up to 80% of the entire process, and that's even including the solve time, which, depending on the type of model, can be a very long process. So, you know, the analysis modeling step can be broken down into a number of different uh, steps. So, like, when, like, if you consider taking that CAD geometry, a lot of times what you need to do is, is get rid of a lot of features that aren't necessary to perform the analysis. It, um, because one of the reasons, if you've got small holes in your model, for example, you try to put a mesh on that, then you're essentially introducing lots of little nodes around that hole, which again increases your uh, um, degrees of freedom, increase the, the number of equations you have, and it's going to take longer to solve that model. And it might be in, in cases where that small hole is really not important to really what, you, what you're trying to solve for that particular part. You're probably trying to find stress maybe in another area of that part. So a lot of times what engineers need to do is they need to simplify that geometry. If they've got 
Uh, so they'll need to take out those small holes, take out the small fillets. Uh, if they've got a thin wall part, they need to maybe uh, change that solid body into uh, surface or sheet bodies in there so they can put uh, shell meshes on it, which would also make the, the, the solving run faster. So there's a lot of work that goes in just to even preparing the geometry, getting it ready for mesh. You, the next step, doing the mesh, takes a long time. So you know, trying to get the right element quality, trying to get, uh, if you've got a very large, complicated model, like a car body or, or airframe that you're trying to mesh fully, even just creating a mesh can take a bit of computing power to create that on some of those on those pieces. Uh, nowadays, we're moving to some more automated things, but it still takes some computing power. And taking creating that mesh, I mean, some of these large models could take weeks, months, even just to create the model before they're ready to solve it. So, how does big computing then really push simulation forward now? So now, as as computing power gets more advanced, we're able to obviously the, the obvious. Uh, change is going to be in terms of fidelity. So this is a much more modern simulation that we've seen, uh, something done with C uh, Star CCM Plus, which is a CFD code again. So you're seeing some of the air, how it flows uh, based off where it's coming out of the wheels and how then it, it flows around the car in the back. So I mean, the obvious answer for you know, how big computing helps simulation, the first one is always obviously fidelity. The next thing is also, again, how it improves analysis modeling. So now we can, if we've got very large computing resources at our means, we can start putting much smaller elements. And if we can get to a point where we're getting very really infinitesimally small elements, maybe we don't even need to worry about element quality as much. So that means we can speed the analysis process. We don't need to worry about how big or what our element quality is. We can also use the power to, to generate these large meshes and really get that analysis, pro or analysis modeling process time and drive it down and get to the results quicker, which is really where engineers want to be able to spend their time in it, look at the results, understand what sort of design changes they need to make to their, to their products. So up until this point, I've been talking about very specific simulation domains. But obviously, in the real world, simulation or, or physics domains don't just happen in silos. So everything's happening at once, simultaneously. So structures doesn't happen in a silo. CFD doesn't happen in a silo. So if you think in terms of really what happens when airflow over, goes over an airplane wing, or in this case, a car spoiler. You've got an airflow that goes over that spoiler. It creates pressures. The pressures of that structure are then going to deform that wing. So that wing deforms. That's going to change the airflow over the wing. So you've got to rerun that, and then it's going to change the pressure. So it's this constant cycle that needs to happen. And so we need to also start bringing, uh, coupling these types of simulations together, which has really been quite a challenge up to this point for a couple of reasons. One, obviously, is the computing power to do that. It takes, I mean, even just to run a basic uh, CFD analysis can take hours or days on some of these more complicated types of geometry. But now you want to try to couple that with a different types of physics solver. That's even going to take up even more computing power. But even from the software side to integrate these types of workflows to set that up and be able to perform the, the analysis to get those two to talk to each other, is a, it takes a significant amount of, of effort from the software vendor. So we're also working towards you know, integrating these more so we can do more real-world uh, types of multi-physics analysis like you see here. So another thing is in terms of, you know, we talked about Edison and, and looking at variations. And you hear that again from Boom and, and a number of the other people I've talked to or that have, have given presentations here. We're, we're now we want to be able to look at thousands of iterations. And so what we can do is we can automate the, the simulation. We can parameterize the model so that they, we, we can quickly update them. And now if you've got large computing resource, now you can send these off in parallel, or in some cases, if some need to be sequential, you can do that. But it really allows you then to automate and be able to look at literally thousands, even hundreds of thousands, maybe, of design variations. So in this case, this example you see here, it's automating uh, some of the dimensions of the spars that are underneath the wing and, and some other uh, properties of, of the uh, simulation model. And basically, each of those dots you see up in the graph is essentially one uh, design iteration. So it's depending on the, the, the criteria, it's, it's color coding them either blue or red. It, it means it did or did not meet certain of the performance requirements in terms of either weight or, or, or some of the other, uh, mar like this is a margin of safety. Uh, um, simulation, so looking at margin of safety for an airplane wing. Uh, so there's a number of criteria it's looking at, and so you can see quickly see uh, which 
design iterations are, are, are passing, and then you can go and, depending on the certain type of application that you need to supply, you can look at a graph like this and zero in on maybe what, what are going to be really the best designs for your particular application. So an example of this in use today uh, is with Airbus. So uh, they were looking at an air bleed system, which basically takes some uh, hot and cold air from the engine, mixes it together, and a lot of times it pushes that into the, the air conditioning system within the cabin. Um, they had a process basically to do this without simulation uh, or without some of the, the design of experiments types of, of um, design exploration like we just saw in the, in the previous video, it would take them about six months to do that process. But now they're able to take that process with some of the automation and large computing resources and get that down into less than two weeks and be able to really help understand and redesign that, um, get down to, to get to the temperature requirements that they wanted for this air bleed system and get something in a much faster time to market that they could have otherwise done in, before. So another area, really interesting area where, where big computing is helping is, you know, in the past we've been talking about the process where a designer creates a design and then we go simulate it. Well, now with big computing, with and also some new software and, and um, mathematical formulations we can do, we can use simulation to help actually drive or, or create new designs. So instead of you know starting with a design, let's just say, okay, we've got a, we've got we know the package space that a certain part needs to fit within. Uh, let's go just kind of put some boundary conditions on where we know the attachment points are going to be for that part. Now let's simulate that. And based, based off structural analysis, maybe some uh, um, performance requirements that we put in there for deflection or, or stress and strain and so on. Basically, we can take that and basically what it will do is it will run an optimization routine. So again, it's a multi-run type of job. It's going to take significant computing resources to get some of these shapes. So the, second, so the first shape you see up there is really... Um, what, what maybe somebody would have, a designer would have designed on his own. But the second shape you see there is really what, the, what a computer would simulate, or, or the design shape that the computer comes up with. So based on the, the loading conditions that were placed on a, on a package space, it might have just been a big rectangle for that spot with some attachment points there in the, in for the three bolt holes. Um, it, it's able to come up with some very unique, very organic types of shapes. Then we can take those shapes and then do some of the more, more traditional types of analyses to refine that, again, parameterize it a bit, uh, rerun that simulation, run it multiple times, or really kind of refine it. But the, you know, as you see with these kinds of shapes, you know, based on traditional manufacturing methods, you're not going to be able to necessarily be able to manufacture that part. But with additive manufacturing now, you can also start generating these really unique types of shapes. So now you get really lightweight, shapes that will really help you know, take the weight out of an airplane or automobile, really help improve fuel efficiency. They're still very strong and meeting, able to meet strength and durability requirements. Now, the other aspect to simulation, in the past, you know, you've seen a lot of pictures with airplanes and cars, so obviously simulation's been heavily used in very large industries, you know, government organizations, as well as aerospace defense, automotive industries. So, but getting, there's lots of people beyond those industries that can benefit from simulation. There are certainly, you know, people are developing golf clubs. There's certainly simulation that can be used there to help drive golf balls farther. There's, uh, you know, medical equipment suppliers out there that can benefit from simulation. But simulation has traditionally been very expensive uh, for companies to get into. The software is expensive. Plus, also, the hardware is even more expensive. And it, plus, they need to maintain it. They need to have staff to be able to maintain it all. And then it goes obsolete you know, relatively quickly. The other thing is small companies aren't going to be using simulation all of the time. So uh, they're only going to be using it some of the time. Otherwise, then you've got a whole bunch of hardware that might be sitting there that's not useful. So with big computing, um, we're able to get, you know, especially when it, with access through the cloud, they can get access, on-demand access to that hardware. And with that also, then we're also making some of the simulation tools available to them on-demand through the cloud platforms as well. So as you see here today, uh, we've got a number of our own uh, simulation tools, our, our CAE or our system simulation tool, SimCenter AIMSIM is available, as well as SimCenter 3D, which is our finite element, multi-body dynamics, CFD code. Uh, that's also available. So you can get those on demand today on Rescale. You can actually access them 
through your web browser without having to install any software on your machine. So it's a great thing for small, co small companies to be able to get out there, uh, get the software on demand, only use it when they need it, and only pay for it when they need it. So an example of this, um, American Axle, which is an automotive supplier, they make you know, axles that go under cars, and they, they need to perform a number of simulations. In this case, it was specific to a fluid domain, uh, a fluid dynamics simulation, basically uh, of the oil that's within some of these axles, and they, they need to flow around, and it needs to get in the gears. And so they have one server there with like 64 cores, but a number of these simulations would take way more than that, maybe like up to 150 cores or more. Um, and I've gone, like, you know, like yours mentioned a couple of days ago or yesterday. Um, so they have the one server there, but they're also sharing that with a number of other analysis teams that are doing vibration simulation and other structural simulations. So even though they've got maybe a, a fairly large solver or server, they can't really get full access to that all the time. So they, American Axle really needed flexibility in order to be able to perform the fluid dynamic simulations that they needed to do. So being able to get access to that type of simulation or, or hardware resource through Rescale really helps them to be able to get the flexibility they need to perform the simulations they need in the time they need it by. So now we've, you know, we've reached a point where everything I've been talking about today is really, up to this point, has been about product development, using simulation in the product development world. But what happens once the part is out in the field? You know, once the part's out there, we don't know what's going on with it. So something like this you could see happen with, our, with the wind turbines out there. But now you see a lot of things where, where especially industrial machinery, everything is outfitted with sensors. So you've probably heard of the Internet of Things. So you've got sensors, you've got wind turbines out there like this that could be outfitted with sensors. You know, and obviously servicing a, a wind turbine is, is really difficult. They're way up high in the air. They're large machines, so getting up there might you know, take a helicopter or something to, to bring one of those down to look at it. So to be able to understand what's happening with that machine before um, a problem like this happens, it's useful. So you might have a sensor out there picking up some vibrations, uh, maybe a vibration that's maybe outside of the norm uh, of requirements that they normally pit, uh, looked at. So that sensor can send that data over to the company or the manufacturer of the wind turbine, which will then have a digital twin of their model. So the digital twin, you might have heard that term a bit, this really comes down to a simulation model of basically what, what's out there in the field. So they can take that uh, vibration data, use that as load case into their digital twin, be able to re-simulate that and say, okay, this is... You know what's going to be the impact of this vibration? Is it going to decrease the durability of some part? What's what's going to be the failure problem, or what's going to be a failure mode with this thing? Um, do they need to go out there and service this? When do they need to service it? So finding that kind of information on your products in the field and finding problems before problems like this happen out there. So a little bit of our, our pitch for Siemens here. Also, you know, so Siemens has been around for 180 years. We've been making things, you know, from gas turbines, to trains, to healthcare equipment. So we've got a lot of experience in industry that we're also baking into our, then our, our software products and the simulation tools. We're taking that knowledge that we've gained from industry ourselves, putting that into the, the, the software that we've got uh, that then can then help you all uh, with, your, with your engineering and simulation needs in the future. Uh, as well as you've got the backbones, again, for, for some of the big computing links with Rescale, as well as the IoT. Uh, application. So being able to take sensor data, bring that through to our, our data management system, bring that into the house, and being able to apply those to our, our CAE uh, models and being able to re-simulate that. So we're definitely looking forward. We like to you know, bring simulation and make big computing uh, available to everyone here and be able to uh, then really make sure that uh, help you with your next breakthrough and help you uh, realize your, your products. Thank you.